it's a, it's an overview of uh, the current landscape of the JVM languages today, and uh, some perspective that uh, allows us to compare uh, Java and Scala according to different facets that uh, that matter, and also uh, it contains a glimpse into what we should expect uh, from future versions of Scala. Okay, so this is uh, what the current uh, JVM landscape. The JVM uh, languages landscape looks like. Um, actually, I think I have um, I have this ruler for you to make it easier to see. Um, so we see that um, in addition to the languages that we are all familiar with, like uh, Java, uh, JRuby, and Jython, which are basically just uh, ports of these languages to the JVM. Uh, we have many more new players that are actually not very new at this point. Uh, Kotlin is not uh, formally out, but it's actually an interesting language to look into. It's uh, being developed by JetBrains, and it's probably the most similar one to, to Scala. Um, one uh, interesting point to note about it is the way that it handles uh, nullability, which is uh, actually more elegant. Um, Kotlin is... Uh, you should expect it to, to be out uh, very soon and you should be able to start playing with it already. Uh, Ceylon is uh, developed and promoted by Red Hat. Uh, it has some very interesting features as well. Um, Groovy is a, is a dynamic language that started more um, with the target of uh, being very much compliant to the Java syntax, uh, make it more dynamic and lightweight. Um, the last uh, release of Groovy also supports uh, stronger typing. Uh, Clojure is a Lisp di dialect that uh, is basically um, compiled to JVM. Uh, Ekamai uh, uses uh, Clojure, for example. So you see that, uh, that Scala appears here twice, and this is uh, to make a point that, uh, in fact, Scala is more uh, object-oriented as well as more functional than Java, and it's uh, more statically typed or type safe. I think that the next slides will uh, elaborate more and uh, provide claims to support it. Um, so this is uh, who's using Scala. Uh, obviously, uh, you see that uh, the Scala school and the tutorials uh, um, uh, are actually um, supported by Twitter and, uh, and most of the activity for these uh, Courses comes from Twitter. Uh, LinkedIn uh, uses Scala a lot, and uh, Foursquare actually started uh, uh, with Scala from day one. Um, Twitter uh, actually had to rewrite much of their uh, backend infrastructure from uh, from Ruby because uh, of uh, scalability issues. This is actually an interesting study that was uh, done by, done by Google. Oh. Actually, this slide is wrong, but a uh, different one shows that uh, the runtime uh, of Scala is very much uh, comparable to, to Java and in uh, many cases faster, which surprised many. Uh, we see exponential growth in demand for, uh, for uh, Scala developers. And uh, there were very interesting uh, design uh, trade-offs that were made in Scala in order to, to balance between uh, expressiveness, performance, and complexity. Uh, many, including me, believe that uh, it, they really managed to get very close to the sweet spot. Um, so the Scala is a functional, object-oriented, statically typed, and uh, compiles to the JVM, which uh, also makes it uh, interoperable with uh, Java and other JVM languages as well. The man and the legend behind uh, Scala is Martin Odersky. Uh, he designed Java Generics, wrote the first uh, Java compiler. Then he admitted many of the mistakes that he made with uh, both of them and uh, tried to fix them in Scala. Uh, now he is uh, both professor at uh, EPFL and uh, he founded uh, TypeSafe uh, with the goal to promote uh, the, the Scala ecosystem. I think that's a good, uh, a good segue to start uh, exploring the, the cool features and the benefits of uh, using Scala. So this is a class employee in Java. What we see here is a standard uh, class with the fields and uh, 
and getters, setters, uh, partial copy constructors, um, equals hash code and toString. Uh, in fact, I uh, added a few bugs here, just uh, to make a point. And also the first name and last name are swapped. The point is that the more code you write, the higher the chances that uh, you have some bugs there. An equivalent class uh, in Scala looks like this. And uh, in fact, what you get here is uh, all of these. So the constructor is basically generated uh, by the compiler. Same for the copy constructors. The getters and the setters, you do not need to write the boilerplate, but you can do that if you want to override and customize the behavior. Um, the equals and the hash code, uh, uh, the approach in Scala is actually very um, much more strict than in uh, Java because there is the equals hash code uh, contract, which means that if two objects uh, uh, are equal, they must have the same uh, the same hash code. This is not uh, enforced everywhere, but all the collections uh, and the case classes as well uh, try to adhere to these uh, constraints. Uh, I think uh, that uh, recursive decomposition is something that we will uh, touch uh, in a few minutes when we talk about pattern matching. Companion object is basically a static class or a singleton class that uh, provides uh, factory methods and uh, other helper uh, methods. This is what singleton, a singleton looks like in uh, Java, and this is the equivalent in Scala, which means that basically the design pattern is now a first-class citizen uh, in the language and has its own keyword. This also means that we can, uh, we can inherit and uh, use all the object-oriented uh, techniques that, uh, that work with uh, instances but do not really work with uh, static classes. Um, everything in uh, Scala is an object. It's something that, uh, that you might be familiar uh, with from uh, Smalltalk and some uh, other languages, uh, which means that ex actually when I write 1 plus 2, I'm actually invoking a method uh, named plus uh, on this uh, object. It doesn't mean that uh, behind the scenes we have boxing, right? It feels object-oriented, but it actually compiles to the same bytecode as, uh, as uh, what you're, you would expect the equivalent Java code to compile to. But it actually allows us to, to do much more. For example, the plus operator, since it's an operator in Java, it's not even uh, visible through reflection. And uh, you can reflect the plus uh, method in Scala because it's just another method. Uh, another thing that which is very important to to remember and exploit is that uh, there are no statements, only expressions, which means that every block returns a value. Um, it's quite ubiquitous. For example, if returns a value, which means that we can assign the result of an of the if to to a variable and we com can compose. So we get a much higher composability, which uh, helps us basically make the code much more orthogonal and uh, reuse the code much better. Same for for. Okay, so we see that uh, for basically this collection, this uh, expression creates a collection um, which is two, four, six, and so on. Okay, we are basically applying uh, the multiplication by two on every um, member here. Um, same here. Here we have a block. So every computation block returns a value. The last uh, expression in the block is the return value. In this case, it's uh, take the, the variable TMP and multiply it by three. And the uh, same for, uh, and this is actually the reason why we do not need to write a return keyword, because uh, if the add function returns a value, then it basically returns this expression. We still can write return. I would say that it's a uh, maybe to make the transition to Scala easier for uh, those who come from uh, more imperative languages. Uh, but it's quite redundant and quite uh, quickly you will uh, notice that you prefer to just omit it. Um, we have a type inference in, uh, in Scala. It is uh, much uh, stronger than uh, the one in C-sharp, but, uh, but actually in Haskell they, uh, they have a stronger type inference. For example, uh, in this case, a variable, we do not need to, to 
specify the type, and the type is inferred. This is basically what we get from the REPL of, uh, of the Scala console. Same for functions. In this case, uh, since uh, the compiler knows that y is an int, it will uh, infer that uh, the signature of this function, the, re the return type of this function, is an integer as well. And uh, the other uh, example, the last example, shows us the least upper bound uh, inference uh, of the type. So in this case, we see that uh, the least upper bound of a list and a set is an iterable. Okay? Um, we have uh, higher order functions uh, in Scala, and uh, a function is a first class citizen, which means that we can uh, pass a function uh, as a parameter, we can uh, assign a function to a variable, and so on. Uh, in this case, a uh, very simple example, we want to add uh, one to each one of those uh, of the members of this list. So we basically define a lambda expression, lambda function that uh, adds this, uh, this value. Uh, we have a lot of sugar in Scala to, to make this easier because uh, these are very ubiquitous and, uh, and frequently used. Um, so we do not need to specify the type since we have type inference. And also we have a placeholder notation that basically means that if we use a variable just one time, maybe it's, it's too much of an over to, to give it a name, right? And we are actually polluting the, the code by, uh, by thinking about a name and uh, giving it a name. In other cases, it's actually useful because it helps us to document the code. But you can use your judgment here. Um, an important principle is the universal access principle, which means that uh, when you um, access a member of a, of a class, and it should be quite transparent for you if it's a, a variable, a function, and, uh, and what kind of a variable it is. Uh, and uh, this means that, the, that actually refactoring becomes very fun and easy. For example, if uh, this class uh, has uh, um, a billion uh, instances, and we do not want to, to waste too much uh, memory um, on, uh, on the members, so we, can, we just change the val here, which is a read-only or a, a constant variable, and uh, replace it with a def, then it becomes a function. That's all we have to do. Alternatively, if we want to cache the value, we can change the def to a lazy val. It will still be lazy, but uh, which means that it will be computed only on the first time that uh, this member is accessed. Um, but uh, but uh, if it's accessed uh, for the second time, it will not be computed again. Okay, so you can just use all of these uh, interchangeably, and uh, it will be transparent to the user. Okay. We have the concept of a default method, which is very similar to, to the indexers in C Sharp. But uh, in fact, in C Sharp, it's uh, much less elegant because the indexer has a different syntax than, uh, than uh, other methods. So what we have here is that uh, for every class, and uh, obviously for singletons as well, we can define a, basically a default method. It's uh, by convention, it's always going to be called apply. And uh, we will be able to call it without uh, specifying the name of the method, like this. So if we have a square object and we want to, basically it, it just uh, computes uh, the square of a number, uh, we can just call uh, square and uh, pass uh, three, and it's going to be equivalent to square.apply. Um, unapply is uh, the concept of actually of an inverse function or a decomposition function, uh, and it's used in uh, pattern matching. So pattern matching basically allows us to, to extract the contents of an object in a very functional uh, and uh, elegant way. For example, we can say, okay, if we have the number 16 um, and uh, we applied square on some number, what would that number be? Um, basically, what, uh, what the compiler would uh, translate it to is uh, to call the, the unapply function on the number, and uh, the result is going to be 4. 
Okay. We are going to see much more uh, uh, powerful examples of uh, when where um, pattern matching makes a huge difference between a readable and unmaintainable code and one that is not. Unlike Java, we can uh, define multiple parameter lists. And uh, it allows us to do very cool things. For example, define new flow controls. So if we want to, to say, OK, loop the, this statement uh, twice. Okay? So this is the first parameter list. And the second one, which could be either a parentheses or the curly braces, is going to be the function. How do we create this uh, language construct? So we define the function loop, which has uh, n on the first parameter list. And the second one is going to be the body of, uh, of the function. This is also called by name. Um, and then basically we just uh, loop and, uh, and call the, the body many times. The other thing that we can do is uh, imagine that you wanted to write a cross product uh, function in Java. Uh, but you wanted to, to use the ellipses, the var args uh, uh, syntax. Obviously, you cannot do this because there is no way that the compiler can know when the first one ends and the, the next list begins. So you need to wrap it with a, with a variable, with a, some collection, and pass uh, these two. You cannot do such thing. Okay? Um, in Scala, it's very simple. This syntax basically is equivalent to the ellipses. And we can uh, basically define multiple um, uh, parameter lists. In this case, we will just say that we want a cross product uh, between 1 to 3 and A, B, C. And uh, the code here, the implementation is uh, straightforward. Uh, the third thing that we can do is uh, basically use uh, partially applied functions, which allows us to, to reuse the code a bit better. But I will not dive uh, deeper into this subject here. Um, a very important statement, which is actually not related to Scala, but uh, um, is uh, how bad of a practice it is to, to use nulls in general. And in Scala, as well as in uh, Kotlin and, uh, and uh, other uh, similar languages, you can actually write idiomatic code that will uh, guarantee that uh, you will not have uh, null pointer exceptions in production. Um, this is partially through the usage of uh, monadic constructs like uh, option, but also the um, infinite number of, uh, of helper functions that allow us to, to avoid nulls uh, very conveniently. I think we will uh, mention a few of these. A bit about uh, multiple inheritance in Scala. Um, so we had multiple inheritance in, uh, in C++, and uh, it was a pain. And uh, the reason why it was a pain is uh, because of the diamond problem, which means that if we have uh, multiple, uh, um, multiple uh, superclasses that we, uh, that we extend on or inherit from, uh, there was no deterministic way to, to guarantee the behavior of, uh, um, of the child uh, class when, uh, whenever there are conflicts uh, in members that appear in more than one superclass. The way that uh, Java and C Sharp actually uh, solved this problem, and it's uh, quote unquote solved, I would say, is by using interfaces, which means uh, that we ditched the, the, all the benefits of uh, multiple inheritance as well. Uh, the way that uh, Scala solves this is using a technique which is called uh, linearization, which allows us to, to um, guarantee a deterministic behavior of this inheritance. You can uh, read more about this. Um, and, uh, and now we can basically define traits, which are like interfaces, but they can also contain uh, implementations. Some of the implementations might be abstract, some, some might be concrete implementations. Um, it's a, a hybrid between interfaces and uh, abstract classes, in effect. A bit about the type system in Scala, which is uh, probably the most powerful one that, uh, that uh, um, any Java developer would have imagined possible. Uh, but, uh, but also, it's, uh, it's quite a complex type system. So 
the the object uh, type in uh, in Java is equivalent to the any ref any reference uh, type in Scala. But we also have the value types. All these are value types. Uh, starting from uh, from uh, Scala 2.10, you can also inherit from this and extend them using uh, value classes. I will elaborate this uh, about this soon. Uh, any is the, the absolute uh, superclass. And uh, also we have the concept of bottom types, like nothing or null, which means that these are types that inherit from anything. And this allows us to, to implement very um, powerful and type-safe concepts. Um, I think I will mention this in a few slides as well. So what can we say about the, the type system in Scala? We know that it's a strong, strongly typed language. It's uh, much stronger than, uh, than Java. Uh, in addition to, to being nominal, which means that you can give names to, to types, you can also define structures, similar to duck typing, but type safe. Okay? Uh, so you can say uh, that uh, a function expects to get uh, a parameter that uh, I do not know the type of this parameter, but I want to, to require it to have uh, certain members or, fun or functions. And I can specify their signatures without actually knowing the type or uh, requiring it to be named in a certain way. So this is a powerful concept. Uh, non nullable I think we mentioned this. Uh, we have the coin contravariance uh, um, as part of the type system. Um, we can define uh, type aliases. Since we run on the JVM, we still have the erasure um, as, a, as part of the implementation of the, of the generics. But uh, in, before uh, Scala 2.10, we had uh, the manifest that allows, uh, allowed us to actually overcome the, uh, the deficiencies of the erasure in many cases. And starting from Scala 2.10, the uh, the manifest are uh, they are replaced by uh, type tags so you might want to look it up as well uh, we have the dynamic uh, classes starting from uh, 2.10 and uh, these are mostly used uh, in interoperability with dynamic languages there is actually no other reason to to use it um, what else can we say? We will also touch uh, the implicit uh, as part of the, the, the type system aspects of the implicit. Uh, path dependent is something that, uh, that will be covered in the spicy track. I think that's enough. So uh, what else can we say about, uh, about type safety? This is uh, actually a simple example of um, that will just crash uh, a Java code in production and uh, just will not compile uh, in Scala. The reason is that arrays are covariant. So if we define an uh, array of ints and uh, basically assign it to an array of object and then we want to, to, to set one of the, of the cells there to be some object, we will get a runtime exception, right? So this is an example of a structural type. Um, those of you who use the C-sharp are probably familiar with the using uh, construct, which basically allows us to, to manage disposable resources and uh, free up uh, um, and close them or free, free the resources. Um, since uh, this is a first-class citizen in Scala, in, uh, sorry, in C-sharp, and in Scala you can just implement it uh, in a few lines, it uh, emphasizes the power of the, uh, of the language. So this is an example. We basically say that we want to, to accept any, um, any type that has a close method. And then we will uh, end the function, right? We will run this function, and then we will uh, close the resource. That's all. Uh, it's actually even more powerful from another aspect, because uh, now, unlike C Sharp, where we need to basically require uh, the the closable to, to implement uh, an interface uh, I disposable. Here, uh, if we cannot really control the fact that, uh, that uh, some value did not implement it, we can still, uh, but they have some method, we can still uh, enforce this functionality. Uh, regarding uh, immutable collections and mutable collections. So, so basically we have two, two mirrored uh, sets of, uh, of collection frameworks, which are uh, you can use them uh, interchangeably. Uh, one of them is the mutable, the other one is the immutable. 
uh, Scala tends to, to prefer and encourage the use of uh, immutable structures in every possible uh, place for, for many reasons. And it's going to be the right choice in many cases, especially when you, when you want to, to write uh, um, distributed or parallel code uh, and do it in a safe way with uh, less overhead. Um, I'm going to, to give a talk in the afternoon about the collection, so I will not uh, elaborate about it here. OK. Uh, here's an example of uh, we want to index um, we want to index uh, these few um, members of an array according to the first character. This is the, and uh, also sort it according to the first character. This is the, the Java code to do this, and also it has a bug. And this is the, the equivalent Scala code. Basically, we say that we take the keywords, sort them, group by the first character. Uh, this example also emphasizes the fact that uh, a string is a collection, which means that it has all the collection uh, uh, methods, uh, including head, which uh, retrieves the, the first character, the first member, in fact. And this is the bug. Another example, if we have a list of, uh, of employees and we want to, to return the list of the names of the employees, in the corresponding order. This is how we do it in, uh, in Java. And this is how we do it in Scala. So we basically take the employees and map them to the getName method. Now at this point, if you try to think about it in a more abstract way, uh, you should start seeing the, these patterns and uh, think about you, how you can apply them in, uh, in your day-to-day -day life, um, unless you do other things than coding. Um, so in this case, we see that uh, if the right-hand side is actually much smaller, much shorter than the left-hand side, do we really need the encapsulation? And the answer is that probably we do need if we want to, to document it or give it a name, but it also changes the trade-offs uh, of when we want to encapsulate because there is no much complexity that we want to hide at this point. A similar example would be calculating the, the factorial of a number. Uh, in this case, we have some aggregator. We run over these numbers and, uh, and multiply the aggregator by the number, uh, and then return the result. The equivalent functional uh, code in Scala is going to look like this. It's basically using the reduce function. So it, we create a range, which is 1 to n, and then we call the reduce function on it. The placeholder notation here means that, uh, that uh, we have a pair. Uh, this pair is basically the current member and, uh, and the aggregator. And, uh, and we want to multiply the left one uh, by the right one. Okay? So this is something that takes time to get used to, but, and it's actually not a mandatory syntax, but uh, once you write uh, more code, you tend to prefer this. Uh, this is an abstraction uh, of, of the same concept. A bit about... Uh, combinatorics. So we have uh, quite a few combinatorics functions, uh, such as uh, get all the combinations of 1 to 5 in this case. Uh, this is part of the collection framework. This returns uh, all these. This will return the permutations. For example, we split, we tokenize the text, and then we return the permutations. And this one returns the subsets. Okay? So we have uh, a lot of convenience methods that, uh, that mean that we do not want, need to work hard and uh, we have more abstract constructs that we can compose. The bottom line, if I had to summarize the, the collection framework in one sentence, would be probably this one. And uh, stopping using loops uh, has a lot of benefits. It makes it easier to, to parallelize. Uh, it makes it uh, much safer and less bug prone. And in many cases, more readable. Uh, so this is a summary of the placeholder notation uh, for your convenience. The left side and the right hand side are equivalent. Okay. So what can we tell about uh, distributed and uh, multi-core co computing? This is actually a very um, one of the design goals for Scala. Make it very easy to to run uh, the code in parallel and write uh, scalable and distributed systems uh, using it. Uh, and uh, we have a very rich uh, assortment of, uh, of options to do this. One of them is the parallel collections. 
So we can take any collection and uh, apply the, the parallel uh, function on it, which will transform it to a parallel collection, which means that every function that we run on it from this point is going to be run in parallel if possible. Obviously, it's not always pos possible. Um, we have uh, futures and promises as part of the language, uh, starting from uh, 2.10, part of the standard library, in fact. Uh, actors uh, is uh, something that we get from, uh, from the ACA framework, which is uh, now part of the type th uh, TypeSafe stack, together with Play and Slick. And uh, it also brings us the software and transactional memory, which is uh, also a part of Clojure. And, uh, it was actually inspired by it as well. Um, and obviously, we can use all the third party uh, tools that are available for the JVM community, such as Hadoop, Spark, and Storm. Spark is actually Scala based. Uh, we can still use the plain old Java threads, but it's not very tempting. Twitter wrote their own uh, implementation uh, uh, on top of uh, cascading and called it uh, Scalding. Um, that's all. So this is a, a comparison of a Hadoop uh, call from Java and Scala. It's equivalent, but uh, but more uh, concise. Um, a nice example about futures would look like this. If I had two sources that uh, that I can uh, fetch some uh, information from, but they may fail, okay. Uh, and also, I cannot guarantee the order at which these re uh, return. I want to print the first uh, result, uh, and only the first one, which means that if both of them fail, I do not want to, to print anything. And if uh, uh, both of them succeed, I want to print only the first one. Um, just try to imagine how you would implement it with the standard uh, Java threads. OK, you will need some semaphores. Um, and here you can just uh, encapsulate this uh, this uh, behavior by saying that uh, I want to choose either from uh, uh, f from one and from two, and on success of each one of them, I want to print. Obviously, what happens here behind the scenes, it's another uh, um, another uh, syntactic sugar here. Uh, it's equivalent to writing print l print ln on uh, on uh, the result of uh, uh, of what we get from here when we call on success. Uh, but you can omit it because whenever you feel that it's obvious and uh, it's obvious to the to the compiler as well. Uh, this is a comparison of what you get when you when you just run the the filter function on the sequential and the parallel collection just by adding uh, um, the par uh, um, suffix here. Spark is uh, basically you write uh, in Scala. You use, uh, you basically take the data from HDFS, and uh, and they claim to to get uh, superior performance in comparison to to Hadoop. So you might want to give it a try. This is how you basically, unlike Hadoop, where you do have a very rigid structure of mappers and reducers, you can have a very dynamic and flexible structures uh, of uh, computational nodes in uh, in ACA when you use the actor model. In fact, you can even pass the reference to to other actors and uh, spawn uh, new basically new actors that will uh, produ uh, produce some computation result. Uh, they may uh, spawn uh, uh, child actors as well, and uh, you can basically make this computational network evolve dynamically. You can do very cool stuff with this. Um, we'll skip this. So one Achilles heel of uh, Java would be the, the tail recursion. So if I need to, to compute a factorial uh, of a very large number in Java, I would just get a stack overflow. Uh, we have a tail recursion optimization as uh, built in in, uh, in Scala. So whenever we uh, the compiler can can prove basically that it's uh, uh, that it's a tail recursion. Basically, it will transform it to a while loop instead of a recursion, and it will uh, basically save us from uh, additional frames and uh, stack allocations. This is how we are used to compose uh, strings in Java, as well as this one. This one is not really safe. Um, 
because um, we can get illegal format conversion exception. Uh, what we are used to from uh, many dynamic languages, and now we also have it in Scala in a very uh, types of way, would be the string interpolation, which means that we can just call uh, these uh, variables from here just by adding uh, the prefix s. The cool thing is that, that you can create your own interpolations. For example, uh, s is just a special case of an interpolation. You can create additional ones for XML or, uh, or SQL queries. In this case, uh, this will produce probably an uh, XML DOM. And this is a powerful example of where uh, um, the pattern matching mechanism uh, helps us write uh, much better code. This is a, an example of a simplification of an expression. So we have an expression, an arithmetical expression. We want to basically take any uh, two consecutive minuses and, uh, and prune them and uh, do the same for plus zero. Okay? This is the essence of this code. But look at the amount of boilerplate that we have here. So we need to check if this is an ordinary operator. If it is, we need to cast to it. Then we need to, to get the operator once we, it's casted and uh, get the arguments, check the instance, uh, the type of the arguments, cast, and so on. Same here. Now, without knowing Scala, I uh, guarantee that you will find the following Scala code much readable than, uh, than, your, uh, than uh, your equivalent Java code. This is the code. So you get an uh, expression. And then basically you use, you use something which is similar to the switch case, but this is a switch case on steroids, which means that it can uh, match recursive uh, structures that uh, include both types and values. And it basically decomposes them uh, recursively. This is what it looks like. So we check, the first case is uh, the honorary operator, that uh, the operator is a minus. Then we have another one with a minus and E. And we want to return the simplified value, the simplified version of E. Plus E zero, return E, otherwise return expression. Okay. Ten minutes. Okay. Value classes allow us to to extend the functionality of uh, of uh, any value type, such as an integer, without actually creating uh, any boxing overhead to it. Okay. So it uh, basically allows us to get a better performance and uh, stop thinking about performance every time that we want to, to make a safer code. So if you have an employee ID and, uh, and a customer ID, if both of them are ints, you have the risk of uh, actually mixing them uh, in the code and uh, using the wrong one. So it's better to maybe extend int and say that I have an employee ID type, but I do not want to, to have the overhead of, uh, of wrapping it up with an object. So this is what we can do now. Um, so uh, Eugene is going to, to give a great talk about uh, compile time metaprogramming. Uh, I really encourage you to, to uh, go to this uh, talk. I will just touch a few places where why it's cool and uh, powerful. Basically, um, compile time metaprogramming is something that, uh, that has a very long history, starting from textual uh, preprocessors in C and templating in, uh, in C++. We have the dynamic uh, reflection in, uh, in dynamic languages and uh, as well as in uh, Java, right? You have, uh, you have the runtime reflection. And obviously you can still do bytecode manipulation. Uh, you can see the deficiencies of uh, each one of these uh, approaches here. And uh, what we have in, uh, in Scala 2.10 now is basically the ability to manipulate abstract syntax trees before the code compiles as part of the compilation process. Uh, and this allows us to, to change the functionality, uh, perform certain checks, uh, enhance the functionality. And uh, let's show you a few examples. So here's a, a first example. We want to write a printf that uh, if we have a constant parameter that we pass to it, and uh, the, the d uh, doesn't match to, to the string here, we do not want to get a runtime exception. How can we do this, right? Uh, so in fact, what we can do in, uh, in Scala is, uh, is basically write a printf function that uh, the implementation is going to be a macro. The macro is aware of the entire context of the abstract syntax trees. That it means that it has access to this string. And then you can write a regular Scala code 
that will run in compile time. So think about it. You can choose whether the code that you write runs in runtime or, or compile time. This gives a lot of power. Another example is an efficient assert. We do not want uh, this, uh, this computation to, to happen if the assertions are disabled. Okay? Another example is going to be type providers. This is actually available in uh, F-sharp as well. Uh, so in this case, what will happen is that uh, this code will uh, access the, um, the database during compile time. And if the database doesn't have the product stable, it will not compile. And if the product stable does, doesn't have the name, it will not compile. Okay? So think about what you can do with it. Uh, type macros allow you to extend the, uh, the set of members that, uh, or the functionality of an object. And it's aware of the, the previous uh, uh, members that the object already had before you, we basically extended it with the type macro. In this case, if we have the method x and we want to inject a sin x that will just run it inside the future, uh, all we need to do is basically extend the lifter. And the lifter is a, is a type macro. So uh, macro annotations uh, are something that uh, Eugene is going to cover, and this is something that uh, the, the community really, really wants at this stage. So it's probably on the roadmap. Um, so in this case, you can just add an atomic macro annotation. That's one example, or a cached macro annotation. You can also compile code to the GPU uh, using macros, because you, you can do everything uh, since you can write your own code. Um, and uh, a good library would be Scalaxy. This is a, a library that allows you to, to extend collections and also compile to the GPU. The compiler is very hackable, so you can just print the, all the phases and actually add plugins to each one of those phases. The compiler library is actually part of the Scala library. You have type safe failures, which means that uh, instead of writing uh, this try catch, you can just say, OK, let's uh, divide 2 by x. And if I get an exception, then this is the default. Okay? And you can also use this as part of the collection. Uh, we have implicit parameters that allow us to, to basically inject, uh, inject some parameter values uh, implicitly without uh, um, adding a lot of boilerplate to the code. In this case, uh, if we want to store some value in the database, we do not want to pass the database to, to every method call because it's redundant and it's uh, implied from the context. So all we need to do is create the, the DB and mark it with implicit, and uh, the compiler is going to inject the DB. Implicit methods allow us to, to basically uh, implicitly convert values between types. In this case, if we have a transfer function that expects to get a euro, and we, pass it, we invoke it with the dollars, uh, we do not want to write uh, the conversion explicitly every time. In this case, if we define this uh, implicit conversion in the scope, the compiler will just infer it. It, infer, it will infer the fact that it will need to inject this, uh, um, this conversion. You need to use it carefully, though. Implicit classes are basically similar to extension methods on C Sharp and the uh, same behavior that you have in dynamic languages. Which means that now I, I want to add the words function on, uh, on this string, on every string. All I need to do is basically define an implicit class that gets the string and uh, define every function as if I am the string. Um, a good example would be this one. I want to, um, to basically say, instead of saying that uh, if I have two sentences, I want to check if they have the same sizes, sizes I would uh, traditionally just split them and check the size here. There is a more fluent way that I can uh, use it by saying, OK, I have two sentences, and I want to check if they have the same size, like this. Okay? And this uh, is allowed uh, using this uh, extension uh, um, implicit class. Uh, we have DSLs. This is the example from the O'Reilly book. So this is actually a Scala code that compiles. That's another Scala code that compiles. That's another one, XPath for uh, JSON and XML, which is quite transparent. You can just uh, extend the language using domain-specific languages by importing libraries. This is one from the, for testing frameworks. Um, we will skip this and this and this. 
Um, these are the, the recommended environments. Um, they have their own uh, pros and cons. And also Scala has the REPL, which means that you can actually just uh, use the console just like you would expect with uh, Python or other languages. Uh, Scala check is a cool framework uh, that allows uh, you to, to generate the values that will make the test fail automatically. Uh, but you also have uh, all the very powerful uh, testing frameworks, Scala test and Spectre. And uh, obviously you can still use JUnit. Let's skip this. This is the recommended material to get started. Uh, Scala has a very active community that you can uh, be a part of. You can see the, the activity here. Uh, you can actually submit pull requests to, to improvements and there is a good chance that uh, if it really does the job, then it will be accepted. Uh, I think that's all. Thanks. <laughs>